Thank you, John, for such a lovely introduction. I'd especially like to thank um, Peter and Jed Barger, one lamb known Thermo Fisher, for uh, allowing me to speak today and share with you our experience uh, with investigating and eventually bringing XPLEX testing uh, to our testing menu at San Antonio. So what I'm going to go over today basically uh, was our rationale for the utility of the potential for the testing uh, with XPLEX beads, uh, which is a different iteration, an additional iteration of lab screen single antigen testing. I'll just refer to it as XPLEX from here on out. The options that you have um, that we utilized at least for validation and uh, some of the intricacies in analytics and interpretation that we've found since we onboarded XPLEX. So uh, I don't know if any of you were there or saw it, but about a year ago I was giving a talk uh, at ASHI 2020 uh, virtual meeting about HLA DSA monitoring and how we work so hard pre-transplant to prevent HLA DSA from occurring, but we all know it happens despite our best efforts, and that's still the ultimate battle, right? So this is our foundational tool, single antigen bead testing on a Luminex platform. Uh, undoubtedly and um, inarguably has revolutionized our ability to detect and identify uh, antibody production and patterns in our patients. And this is one of the base panels, um, both class one and class two. Uh, the big question that we always ask though is, is this foundational tool really enough for us to do a good job when we're virtual cross-matching. And beyond that, when your patient is post-transplant, is this tool really enough to make you feel confident and make your clinicians feel confident that you're detecting what you need to post-transplant to keep your patient safe or give accurate assessments of the current immunologic picture of your patient? So thinking about that foundation, for us in San Antonio, um, kind of always are thinking about what can we do differently, what we, can we do better. And I'm sure it hasn't escaped your attention that there are a lot of HLA alleles out there. There's a lot of possibility, right? So when you look at the tool that we have and you look at the number of HLA alleles that are possible, it's kind of overwhelming to think about. When I have uh, fellows uh, or residents come through the lab for their rotations, I always give them the same spiel. You know, uh, HLA is the most polymorphic system in humanity, and they kind of give me this glazed over look, and I'm like, okay, let's, let's bring it back. Let me, let me make that more tangible for you. There are lots of different antigen groups in HLA, right? So one of those is A2. Well, there are well over 700 different flavors of just A2. And then their eyes get real big, like, yeah, there you are. Now you're with me, okay? Um, so when we think about the amount of protein variability that's possible, uh, we look at Common Well Documented 2.0, uh, and we think to ourselves, well, it's, it's okay, because at least most of those aren't really commonly seen. Then, of course, Common Intermediate Well Documented 3.0 comes out and broadens that picture, so maybe now we're not quite so comfortable. But then you look at P and G group definitions, you're like, okay, these things are still, we've still got some things that are similar, but still our antibody testing coverage is nowhere near what's possible. And then you look at papers like this paper that was published in Human Immunology in 2017. Uh, if you look at panel C and D at the bottom, uh, in this paper, their T cell and B cell flow cytometric cross matches show absolutely horrible correlation with their detection of anti HLA donor specific antibodies. So they kind of dug into that and they found that 50%, 56% of their virtual cross-match failures were likely linked to false negative single antigen testing. And they um, 
realized that maybe a potential criticism of their work would be that maybe prozone is what's contributing to that. So they actually took um, their samples and performed one to 10 dilutions to try to uncover a little bit of prozone and um, were able to do so in several cases, uh, but prozone didn't explain the total picture. Uh, they went on to find that in several of their patients, by using supplemental antibody panels, some of those supplemental targets that were not on the base panel detected additional donor-specific antibodies that were correlate with their cross-match outcomes. So this paper really laid the majority of their virtual cross-match failures on the holes in their single antigen testing without using supplementary panels. So we have this similar concern in San Antonio, Texas. We are a majority um, Hispanic Latino population and our population is growing by leaps and bounds every year. Um, I myself am a transplant to San Antonio and absolutely love it. I can absolutely understand why people move there in mass. And as you can see from our 2019 census data, um, San Antonio is in Bayer County. It's not spelled that way, but that's how it's pronounced. And in Bayer County, we have a very high rate of foreign-born immigration. So our population is expanding, and it's expanding to become more diverse. And so in South Central Texas, these are some of the HLA alleles that I see very commonly in my patient and my donor typing. And none of these alleles are represented on the base antibody detection panel that I utilize. So right there is a problem. My patients and my donors are in a gap. They're in a place that I can't really definitively say I can see them when I'm testing for antibodies. So what about alternative panels? Uh, you do have options out there. You've got Luminex mixed beads, which do represent some of those other antigens, but that's less sensitivity and specificity than single antigen identification. You've got the Flopere, same issue. Um, and you've got supplemental panels, which is great, but it means that I'm going to have to run another test. I'm already running tons of tests. I'm going to have to run another test. So then I go to a regional meeting and along comes XPLEX. So this assay was unique to me, something that I had not seen before in that it's a single antigen bead platform. So it has the sensitivity and specificity of single antigen identification, but it's not a separate test. It is a separate panel, but you're spiking it into the test that you're already running. So you're really not running a separate analytic test. And the workflow um, that is uh, suggested by uh, one Lambda Thermo Fisher is down there at the bottom of the screen. So this capitalizes further, too, on the utility of the LabScan 3D instrumentation. We have room for 500 beads, and we don't even come close to using that with most assays. But if you combine XPLEX with the base panels, you have a total of 151 class 1 beads and 119 class 2 beads. So not only do we utilize the instrumentation uh, more to its capacity, we still have room to grow if we need to. So, in addition to that, as I'm looking what XPLEX offers, it is directly pertinent to my patient population. Highlighted there in yellow are some of the class one targets that I extremely frequently see in my patient and donor pool. And highlighted there in yellow are some very frequent targets that I see in my class two patient and donor pool. So I'm thinking as I look at this, you know, I've got these patients and donors in this gap. My population's growing, it's diversifying. And then if you think about March um, and the allocation change that happened, broader sharing is on the horizon. So not only is my local population becoming more diverse, the donors that are gonna come across my door are also gonna be diverse outside of my population. So this is, this is um, very intriguing to us at this point. 
Another thing that I like to point out is in our analysis, we're always trying to determine um, what, is, what is real. And one tool that I love to use to do that is the presence of G group and P group beads on these panels. When those beads that are genetically identical react apart, it's a good cause for concern, or at least an indication that you should look a little bit more closely at the validity of the data. And so these add some additional beads to allow you to extend that type of scrutiny to your analysis. So we chose to evaluate XPLEX for all of our solid organ uh, uh, patients, both pre and post transplant. Um, XPLEX covers many alleles um, that we see in our population, but I'm also thinking broader sharing, right? Because I'm going to start getting donors that don't represent my patient population at all. Um, so a, a very uh, fair question is why in the world would you do this with pre and post transplant? Post transplant, you know the donor type, maybe the donor isn't any of those things. Why run that extra test? Why spend that extra money? Why do that? And my thought is that every antibody that's legitimately detected is a DSA waiting to happen. That's absolutely true pre-transplant, but even post-transplant. Um, what if your patients end up back on the list? You need good data to inform those virtual cross-matches of the future. So when we were ready to start validating this test and really, really putting it under scrutiny, we wanted to know, what is the proper serum bead ratio that we should be using when we're adding this additional bead uh, component into our assay? Uh, we want to know about the utility in patients of differing antibody abundance and range, reproducibility, interaction with serum treatments. We do treat our serum samples with EDTA, and on occasion, we use adsorb out beads uh, for high background treatment. And do we find what we suspect? I think every single one of us sees serologically similar beads stacking together, and you try to fill those gaps in your mind, right? I've got all the DQ6s, except I don't have a bead for that one DQ6. But if all the other ones are there, that one's there too, probably, right? Isn't it? So we can put that to the test. So we chose to take 30 patient samples um, previously characterized by standard single antigen panels, a range of sensitizations, and samples that required differing serum treatments. We tested four uh, bead serum combinations against the uh, original test that was run, but we also re-ran the test baseline in parallel to account for any freeze-thaw differential, technical differential. Um, all of those things that we know contribute to variability in our single antigen testing. And this is what the data looks like. I know we don't have time to go through it bead by bead, such as I did, as interesting as it was. Um, so let's look at maybe zooming in on one of the patients in the study. So we found overall pre preservation of our previously detected specificities. If you look um, to the immediate right of the specificity listed, that is the normalized MFI value of the original test. To the right of that is the normalized MFI value of the repeat baseline single antigen panel. To the right of that is your 30 uh, microliters of serum with XPLEX beads and single antigen. To the right of that is 35 microliters of serum. And to the right of that is 40 microliters of serum. So kind of surprisingly, we, um, we saw you know, some diminishments in MFIs with the higher amounts of serum in our population. Overwhelmingly, we had the best concordance with 30 microliters of serum in the system. Uh, so we saw um, reasonable pattern preservation. We saw preservation overall of weak specificity detection. Uh, we did see some surprises, and we also saw some I told you so's. In this particular patient, uh, if you look at the XPLEX beads that were added in for class two, um, kind of just take you back here for a second, uh, so you can see this patient has some DR4 stacking. This patient has a couple of the DR14s, but not all of them in the baseline panel, and has the DR53 beads reacting. When you look at the XPLEX beads added in, some of those patterns carry forward. We have DR4 reactivity in the XPLEX beads at that same weak range, but not all of them. 
Uh, we do have additional DR14 reactivity and so on and so forth. So there were some surprises and there were some I told you so. so those are probably there. And we can't go through data point by data point. This is uh, kind of what the data for about five of the patients in the data collection look like. And this is just to highlight to you that the groupings of the five runs of patient data were pretty, pretty tight. Um, if you tried to look at the whole thing at once, you'd go cross-eyed. It looks kind of like this. Um, but you can see we chose patients with a variety of reactivity ranges, and uh, the groupings were on the whole pretty tight, pretty repeatable. So like I said, we ended up choosing uh, 2.5 microliters of single antigen beads, 2.5 microliters of X-plex beads um, incubated with 30 microliters of serum. This seemed to give us the best preservation in data and uh, the, the best overall sensitivity. We do use um, baseline, the um, rapid version of this test, and that's why we didn't immediately start with five microliters of serum as the one lambda baseline protocol suggests. Overall, and this was based on the most um, uh, conservative assessment, we saw about 85% concordance in the data at this level. And this is in comparison to the non-XPLEX parallel data for each individual bead. Most of the variability that we saw was actually between the original run and the baseline run repeated, which for some of these samples was several years and freeze thaws later. So phase two, um, we had to do a reproducibility and instrument comparison test with that chosen optimal serum bead ratio. So we took uh, as many of the uh, samples that we had remaining as we could from phase one, and we ran them on the three Luminex 3D instruments that we had in the lab, and we showed 96% concordance between instruments and about 90% concordance with the phase one data. So we approved the validation in December of 2020 and immediately went live. And since, we've done a little over 9,000 antibody identification tests with XPLEX beads. So I'm going to start with the negative. Um, be totally transparent in this talk about the, the rosy and the not so rosy. Um, the only con that we've really seen is nonspecific binding. And to give you an example of what this looks like in our experience with XPLEX, we have a lot of C-specific, especially C17, um, non-specific binding. And it usually is in common uh, combination with non-specific binding that we see in the base panel too. Uh, so this is a patient that has a really, really broad C-stack. Top ranking bead is A1102. Anybody else ever seen that? Um, and you can see highlighted in the patient's raw data all the XPLEX beads that are represented in that reactivity. This is the flow PRA screen for that patient. I will say that there's great representation of most of those positive beads on the flow PRA panel. Here's a class two example, a little bit scarier looking. This patient has a real tight uh, DQ5, DQ6 stack with really robust reactivity. Uh, and so that new bead, um, DQ Alpha 0501 and DQ Beta 0503, is included in that reactivity panel. Uh, when we run the flow PRA on this patient, we get pretty much nothing. And when we do a surrogate cross match with a DQ Alpha 0101, DQ Beta 0501 patient, we get bub kiss. Uh, and that's our top rank bead. So this is negative. So the pros, uh, let's get to those because those are much more numerous. We have had several pre-transplant catches without reflex testing because of the XPLEX panel. We get better, more accurate virtual cross-matching out of this panel. Uh, we have had several post-transplant catches. Basically, our patient went from having no DSA to all of a sudden having DSA because we could test for it. Um, so that has happened in a few uh, circumstances. So we went from having to estimate reactivity based on the serologic equivalence of DSA that was present on the base panel to actual DSA detection. Here's an example. Thank goodness for DQ5, DQ Alpha 0101, DQ Beta 0503. Um, we had a little girl who needed a kidney. Her grandmother wanted to come forward for her. Her grandmother was a DQ Alpha 0101, DQ Beta 0503, and a DR14. So 
you can see there, the little girl's antibody pattern um, detects no um, DR14 that we would be concerned about, um, but all the other DQ5 beads that are present on the panel, the two that are there um, on the base panel, are positive. So we have a really strong suspicion that this girl is probably making antibodies to the other DQ5 as well, but we don't know for sure uh, because we don't have a bead for that. So in this circumstance, without that bead, without XPlex, I would have to do another separate test requiring either a draw from the donor or a draw from a surrogate donor to get at that 0101, But now I don't have to do that because we ran XPlex on this little girl and here are the additional um, XPlex beads um, from that little girl sample and indeed the DQ 0101, is there. So thanks to this ability to test with these additional beads, I don't need to go to the donor and ask them for a sample, which causes a lot of emotional impact and questioning in the donor and patient. I don't have to wait for that sample. I don't have to perform an additional test. I don't have to find a surrogate donor to do a cross match. So, in summary, XPlex has lifted many of our patients out of the single antigen gap that we all see. It had many targets we needed, it was flexible, it did not decrease our ability to detect weak antibodies, it confirmed our suspicions in many uh, circumstances. Um, it has no greater issues than baseline panels and nonspecific um, binding, but it is there. Um, overall, XPlex saves us time and resources. I especially want to thank um, the University Hospital HLA Laboratory, especially my super techs, my uh, technical supervisor, Princess Alexis George, and uh, my super tech, Janet uh, Franco, who were uh, instrumental in getting all of this validation work done and collected. Thank you.